The name's Salmond, Alex Salmond. And welcome to the Alex Salmond Show from here in Gibraltar, where they're spinning the economic wheel once again. For centuries, Gibraltar's been a garrison town. Even 25 years ago, 60% of its spending was military-based, defence spending. Now, it's only 6%. And taking its place has been gaming, tourism, financial services. Today, we chart the course of that change and examine what it means for the future of the rock. But first, over to Tasmina in the studio for your tweets, your emails and your messages. As ever, we're really grateful to you for your tweets, messages and emails, so please do keep them coming in. The first one I have here is from a real fan of Alex. Morgan says, just watch the Alex Salmon show. I love that man. Thanks very much, Morgan. Next from Davies, who said, not surprised at all about how inclusive Alex and Tasmina are on the Alex Salmon show. It ought to be watched more. It's on RT UK News. Look it up. Agreed. Then from Jean, who says, Alex Salmon Show, why are there no subtitles available for the hard of hearing? Well, Jean, I'm hoping that uh, most TV sets do have that facility available. But once you've checked yours out, if you haven't already done so, could you email back and let us know? And we'll see what we can do to help out. But thanks so much for messaging us. Finally, Fiona says, as ever, interesting and informative. Desperately need more of the Alex Salmon Show. Well, thanks to you, Fiona. And now back to Alex himself in Gibraltar. Now, over the last quarter century, the rock has been very much an economy in transition. The transition from a military-based economy to a service-based economy. And joining me now is uh, Naomi Sarah Quigley, uh, a local businesswoman. Uh, you've experienced at least a latter part of that change. H how do you find this move into the services that Gibraltar is engaged in? I think Gibraltar is such a resilient place and so like you said going from being when I came here it was st there was still an element of it being a garrison town you would see the soldiers sort of walking in their military gear and you, you never see that anymore and it, it, it's something that's so slowly happened over the years um, and with that with the economy having been so deeply dependent on the MOD things had to change and the financial services sector can continues to change it continues to evolve all the time and we're heavily heavily based in the gaming sector now but it's moving on and on and on now the, the pillars of this new service economy, let's call them the, the pillars of Hercules are financial services uh, the gaming industry uh, tourism of course uh, and and the property market how do you see that uh, that new composition of the Gibraltar economy standing up to the the test of time. They are the, the four main components that we have here and each one is kind of um, is increasing in its own way. They've invested very heavily in the tourism product here particularly we've had the Skywalk just open recently. Um, we've got sort of really interesting kind of rope bridge thing for people to go on and the caves in the, of, are, have been there obviously forever and they it doesn't matter how many times you go in them they're amazing. So the tourist product is wonderful in itself and the government's investing heavily into, into promoting that. But essentially our economy it hangs very heavily on gaming and um, it also yeah the financial services sector because the fragility of gaming exists worldwide I mean people worry about it here they worry about the impact that Brexit will have so let's just say for the sake of argument there was a new regulation introduced in the uh, in the UK saying that all gaming companies had to be headquartered in the in the UK or, or change the taxation balance. Uh, how would Gibraltar cope with such a, an economic shock in the future? I th to be honest, I think we're already preparing. We're preparing for that. At the end of the day, gaming is heavily influenced by political will and that in itself means it's incredibly vulnerable, no matter where it is, whether it's Gibraltar or, or, or Malta or whatever. So it's, it's heavily influenced by that. So we're already preparing for that. We're already creating new products and particularly the sort of DLT space, uh, Gibraltar's at the forefront of that. And, and I personally have been involved in sort of helping with the, um, the branding, the marketing for ICO launches and so on. So we're already shedding our skin and moving on to no newer things, I think, really, as a community. And in terms of the, the tourism offer, I mean, there's a fair bit of ingenuity, you know, when you're short of uh, uh, real estate space to, to build a five-star hotel, then, then get one that, that floats on, <laughs> Float on, one on the Mediterranean. I mean, <laughs> so is this the sort of innovative approach that's going to stand Gibraltar in good stead? Well, I think, actually, the history of Gibraltar speaks for itself. I mean, it's been... It's been and obviously the protectorate of the UK, but it's the resilience of the people as well here for sort of 300 plus years um, that they, they, they carve out their own destiny. And I think that that will continue to be the case. 
Now, turning to financial services, uh, you've seen the growth of Gibraltar as a, a significant financial uh, uh, centre. Which areas of the financial offering do you, do you see as the Gibraltar offering a, well, if not a unique selling point, then a very strong selling point? Well, I definitely think that the, the DLT sector is, is one of our strongest um, products at the moment because we've been at the forefront of creating the legislation here. This is because Gibraltar has its own legislative competence. You're yes. able to do what exactly? Well, it means that if somebody wants to, um, to launch an ICO here or um, an ITO, um, they, they have it in, the, in a structure and a framework which validates them more than anywhere else in the world. And so that has been heavily crafted here by incredi the incredible legal teams. Um, and there are several sort of major legal um, firms here uh, that are represented all over the world, but they've worked very hard to do that. That's part of the resilience I was talking about with Gibraltar. I think Gibraltar is an incredible entrepreneurial group there's an incredible group of entrepreneurial minds here. So that's something you're able to do because of Gibraltar's own judicial competence. Yes. You're able to, to frame a, a system mm. of, uh, of legislation which suits particular financial offerings. Well, particularly, I think, the, as well, the, the uh, financial services structure that we have here has been rigorously tested as well over a long period of time. Um, with any kind of offshore jurisdiction, you're under incredible scrutiny. So it, it's really important. And they've, the, you know, the, the, the legal firms, the accountancy firms and so on, they've worked very hard to ensure that they have a, a clean product to bring to market. And, and that's something that I, I think you ought to be quite proud of, really. Now, one, one fashionable way of estimating the success or otherwise of a... Uh, a regional economy uh, a few years ago was to go up to the, the tallest building and count the number of cranes. <laughs> if there were a lot of cranes, <laughs> the economy was doing well. If you did that in Gibraltar just now, things would look pretty robust. Uh, yeah. Is that an accurate description of the, the real estate sector? I, w I would say so, yes. I mean, the, you, can, you can hear the building work going on, you can see the bu building work going on here. Um, some of the projects that I've been involved with here in, in my work, um, you know, over the last uh, three or four years of, you know, in the, in the realms of sort of £450 million pounds worth of investment into developments here locally. Um, and when you look at that, that is testimony to the confidence that the, the rest of the world has in Gibraltar as well. Um, and I think that that's, I think it's well placed. I think that people see the resilience that's here and they, um, they have confidence that no matter what, their, their money's well spent. Every now and then you get sort of somebody who says, oh, I'm waiting for the bubble to burst. But, you know, I've been hearing that for the past 15 years and I haven't seen a significant correction in the market. So what particular characteristics make the, the rock a good place to, to grow your business? Um, I think positioning. I think the fact that we have such strong links to the UK, uh, the fact that we have um, you know, the, the, the same legal system. Um, the, it's, you know, for a, lot of, for a lot of people, they want to be in an English-based environment and they, they have that here. Um, I would also say that Gibraltar welcomes people with open arms. That's not to say that it's, it's not discerning in who it allows to set up and do business here, but nonetheless, it's a very welcoming framework within which you know, to, to set up. And there's still so much opportunity. Yes, you've mentioned tourism and, and, um, and property and the financial services sector and obviously gaming, um, but there's still so much more growth to be had. And, and somebody that comes here that has an entrepreneurial spirit, I think, senses that and feels it. And um, I also believe that if you, if you have a little bit of talent and you're prepared to work very, very hard, Gibraltar offers you that opportunity. How about the uh, gender balance in Gibraltarian business and politics? There doesn't seem to be all that much parity at the present moment. Uh, are things going to move in the, in the right direction? I would say that the, the reasons for maybe a, a bit of a discrepancy there is, is not a lack of will because certainly in my experience I haven't found that my gender has placed any I've not been discriminated against in any position but the reality is is that maybe there just aren't enough women putting themselves forward prepared to take those risks and, and maybe dare I say prepared to take certain sacrifices as well that come with being you know uh, 
successful within business. So the opportunities are there. If you're a woman, you're prepared to take them and put the, the same level of work in that you would if you were a man, then the opportunity is there. It's certainly, I wouldn't say it's discriminatory. And would we have to look too long into the future to see perhaps the, the first uh, woman Gibraltarian chief minister? Well, I'm, I'm sure that Gibraltar will be one of those, one of the leaders in that area, yes. <laughs> and now, are you looking to the, the future? I mean, with the various fog of uncertainty, which is, uh, which is still there if, as far as Brexit concerned, the reaction about the border, how to cope with that change, would you say you're, you're confident about the, the ability of the, the rock to withstand these pressures? Yeah, and it's not just a soundbite to say that it's withstood worse in the past. It really isn't, and it, it has. And, um, yeah, there may be corrections ahead and so on, but I think with the, the collective of experience, the collective of, um, like I mentioned before, the entrepreneurial spirit that's here um, and the comfortable environment for business to grow, I think we'll just adapt, adopt and improve. So. Uh, I, uh, I can't guarantee the future, but I can guarantee you a, an Alex Salmon quake. <laughs> that is uh, lovely! You know the drill, uh, the whiskey and the quake, only scotch of course, uh, and then you pass it round your, your many, many close friends. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now, if you want five-star accommodation in Gibraltar, you don't find it on land, you find it on sea, or at least in the harbour. I'm now joined by Mark Skivok the general manager of the floating five-star accommodation, the Sunborn. Mark, a pretty ingenious idea when you're shot a land to put your five-star hotel in the harbour. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, in a kind of relatively real estate scarce environment, this is a perfect example of, uh, you know, a, a hotel that serves the purpose um, in an area which actually, as you mentioned earlier, truly needed it. and. Uh, here we came, the Sunborn that came to the rescue. Now you've had a, a substantial career in hospitality across yeah. a range of the great hotels in the world, but did you ever Thank think you. you'd be in a floating hotel? No, I didn't, you know, it was, uh, but when I came across it about two years ago, I said, absolutely, I'm gonna jump on this, literally. <laughs> now there's no chance of the, the Sunborn ever steaming out of Gibraltar, is it, towards Morocco? It's, it's here for good, is it? <laughs> It's here, yes, it's stationary, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had guests come to me and say that, hey, Mark, hey, I have a great idea for what we, we could do for our guests. At five o'clock every day, we could go out for a sunset cruise. And I said, well, that would be a really great idea, but what about all of our guests that are gonna be coming back to, the, to their room? And what are we gonna do with them then? So we just decided we're gonna keep it here stationary. But just as a matter of interest, are the engines in full working order, Captain? It actually can, can propel itself, um, and we can turn on the engine and uh, uh, all of that, but uh, honestly, it's better to keep it uh, quiet. So. And from your experience in, in hospitality, I mean, wh wh what is the, the key attraction of Gibraltar? For people thinking of coming to visit, wh what would you say was the, the, the unique selling point of yeah. Gibraltar? Well, I think that the, uh, really the unique thing is here is that we are situated between three countries. Now we have Morocco, we have Spain, we have uh, Portugal behind us, and then we are um, Gibraltar. So when we're standing on this peak of this rock, uh, and uh, you can see all of these uh, from here, and on top of it, think about the history. Um, you know, you just met one of our guests uh, who served in the military 40 years ago um, and now returning. So there's a great deal of history and uh, the nature as well. And in terms of the future of the Gibraltar economy, is the, the rock, in your opinion, on firm foundations? I believe so. I truly do. I mean, business is booming. Um, in the last two years that I've been here, um, you know, there's been more and more companies coming to establish themselves, um, and the uh, market is great. Mark Skiver, thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. The sovereignty of Gibraltar remains a major point of contention in Anglo-Spanish relations. Despite the fact that the majority of Gibraltarians are British citizens with British passports, Spain refuses to relinquish a claim over the territory. There is a geographical logic to the Spanish position, albeit that Gibraltar's current status rests on the international treaty which ended the War of Spanish Succession in 1713. However, 
Gibraltarians overwhelmingly rejected proposals for Spanish sovereignty in the 1967 referendum, and even the idea of shared sovereignty in 2002. And under the Gibraltar Constitution of 2006, the territory now governs its own affairs, although some powers, such as defence and foreign relations, remain the responsibility of the UK government. Former Tory party leader Michael Howard once said, Britain would be ready to go to war with Spain to defend the outposts, for many evoking memories of the 1982 war with Argentina over the Falklands. But despite all this fighting talk, Spain continues to knock at Gibraltar's door, and for the most part, Gibraltar chooses to ignore its overtures. The territory has evolved to the point where it now has a separate legal jurisdiction from the UK and also enjoys a different tax system. It has become a significant offshore financial centre, attracting various financial institutions with its attractive tax and regulatory regime. In many respects, some might argue that it has the best of all worlds. But can that lucky status be maintained post-Brexit? Today, Gibraltar's economy is powered by tourism, gaming, financial services and cargo ship refuelling. Alex wanted to find out more about how the territory's economy continues to grow at an impressive rate. We commissioned a study uh, of what impact the Gibraltar economy had on the Spanish economy. So we commissioned an independent study uh, and it proves that actually the Gibraltar economy is hugely beneficial to the economy of Andalusia. We're the second biggest employer in the Andalusian region. We create one in four jobs uh, and uh, we, we literally contribute hundreds of millions of pounds to the Spanish economy. Kristen Hernandez, as president of the Chamber of Commerce, you must be studying closely, looking for economic impacts of Brexit on Gibraltar. Yes, that, that's right. Uh, our economic model was based on access to the EU. We voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU and uh, now we, we have to see what effect a hard Brexit could have in the Gibraltar economy. Um, so it's, it's very much a, a, a watching game yet, there's too many balls up in the air for us to make a, a, an analysis. But looking around uh, the rock, I mean, it's flourishing. There's cranes all over the place, building what's going on. There's not much sign of uncertainty there. That, that, that's right, but the reality is we haven't had a hard Brexit scenario yet. We're still in the EU, we're still functioning uh, as, as we were doing in 2016. Uh, we're a small, nimble, diversified economy, so we adapt uh, and, and we're trying to adapt. Now, is, is the key difficulty that Gibraltar could have uh, access to the huge labour supply that comes in on a daily basis from Spain, or alternatively, is it the impact of perhaps not having access to the single market? I think it's more a labour issue. Um, on the single market, over 90% of the business that Gibraltar does is UK facing. We already have a commitment from the UK government that we will continue to have unfettered access to the UK market for those businesses. Um, the problem we have is that we create a lot more employment that we're able to supply locally. So I think it's in a region of 15,000 people a day crossing over from Spain to work in Gibraltar. And of course, you wouldn't have seen it personally, uh, but your predecessors in the Chamber of Commerce, when Franco closed the border all these years ago, uh, they must have seen a huge impact even at that time. Correct. Uh, in, in 1969, the border closed almost overnight. Uh, thousands of, of Spanish workers uh, were prevented to come, from coming to the Rock to work and uh, at the time we had to be uh, inventive, we had to look, think outside the box and at the time we looked to Morocco to, to import that labour and in fact a lot of those Moroccans that came to Gibraltar to work are now members of the community and have been here for, for 50 years. But you must have, of course, allies, your close neighbours in Spain, the workers who come across every day. I mean, they want, want to see a situation where where their government is, uh, is attempting to restrict our travel. That's absolutely correct. Um, across the border in, in, the, in the Campo area, which is the immediate vicinity of Gibraltar, um, there is a lot of cooperation, uh, we think, as one. We have, a, we, in fact, the Chamber is one of the founding members of a cross-frontier group, which is a Gibraltar-Spanish group comprised of trade unions and business organisations. We speak with one voice, and that voice pretty much says we want frontier fluidity, we want a smooth post-Brexit transition um, and at a local level we, we haven't really got any problems with our Spanish neighbours. So Christian, have you been surprised by some of the political debate that's taking place in the UK which seems to be focused on the customs union as opposed to the primacy of access to the European economic area? I mean Gibraltar's not in the customs union but your services have prospered 
through access to the European marketplace. That's right. We've built a very successful economic model on the basis that we provide services to Europe. We're outside the customs union. We've always been outside the customs union because that is uh, the model that suited Gibraltar when uh, the UK became a member of, of the European uh, community back then. Um, so we've always been outside the VAT free zone, but we've always been able to provide services into Europe, and that is a model that works very well for us. And would you say there might be a lesson there for the politicians in London looking for a solution to this Brexit dilemma, that perhaps they should be looking at how Gibraltar is positioned, uh, as opposed to trying to change how Gibraltar has its structures itself? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I have a, a, most of my clients come out of the UK, they come out of the City of London mainly, and when I talk to my colleagues there, they are of the same view that the main priority for there is freedom to provide services and not so much freedom of movement of goods. They would be quite happy to stay out of the customs union. So, Kristen Hernandez, from Gibraltar Chamber of Commerce point of view, if you could have a message to Theresa May, the, the Prime Minister, what would it be from a Gibraltar perspective? Two things. The first and most important thing is that we want to have the same deal that the UK negotiates for itself. We don't want to be um, extricated for from any deal because of Spanish political pressure. So that's actually absolutely crucial for us. And the second uh, point is that uh, we would want to be able to, to continue providing services into Europe. Well, Christian Hernandez, I, I can't wave a wand and make sure you listen to in London. However, I can give you an Alex Salmon show quick. And you know the drill, some of your uh, yeah. very, very competitively priced whiskey in the quake, pass it around your close friends. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. For the interview. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. One of the great things about Gibraltar being such a confined space is you never know who you're going to bump into. And today I bumped into George Donald from, uh, from Glasgow, here to celebrate his 46th wedding anniversary, but someone who was stationed here back in the 70s. George, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alan. Tell us a bit about when you served in the, the RAF back then in the, in the 70s in Gibraltar. I was posted out here in August 1970 as a telegraphist, and I ended up working on Ashy rescue launches in Gibraltar. Um, it was, I'll be honest, when I arrived, I was disappointed because the first thing I noticed was it was Watney's Red Barrel. <laughs> and I wanted to be overseas, and this was, it seemed like Britain in the sun. You wouldn't want a wee heavy or something? Yeah, <laughs> but a different heavy, not tartan or anything like that. So, so obviously then it was largely a military-based economy. Yeah. The, the vast bulk of the uh, Gibraltar's spending was based on the, the Ministry of Defence, the Air Force, the Army. Yes. Now it's quite different. What are the biggest change you've noticed? Uh, is the building that's going on round about and the reclaimed land. Uh, where I was actually working is now a car park. Uh, it used to be water. <laughs> it's a car park now. I was on the camp this morning, which is now Gibraltar Army. Very few Air Force, very few Navy. And I don't know if there's an army regiment other than the Gibraltar Army now, but there used to be a full army regiment here. And that was always regarded as a, a, an R&R &R posting, and you know, relies on recreation after a, a tough posting elsewhere. Alex, we worked hard. I was going to say, <laughs> but the Air Force were different. You didn't. Yeah. You weren't the layabouts like the army. No. <laughs> well, it was a hard job for them as well because they did an awful lot of the garden for the uh, navy and such like. Um, a lot of ceremonial being Gibraltar, um, and. I didn't work hard when I was here. I sweated a lot, but that was the sun. So having come back after yes. 45 years, yes. uh, are you going to come back again? Very much so. I mean, I know it's changed. I know it's high, high rise. But when you get into the centre of Gibraltar, it's, the heart is exactly the same as it was in the 70s, early 70s. It's just exactly the same as it was. And what's your greatest memory from way back then? is actually working on marine craft and the people, I mean, the people are more British than Britain. Uh, I think we could learn a lot about nationalism from them. A bit about pride? Yes. Yeah. And do you think, a lot of people say that was forged by Franco when he closed the, you were here just after yeah. Franco closed the border? Yeah, the, the border was, had just recently closed. They used to come out now and again and grease the runners and we thought it would open, but that never happened. Um, and very much they were into Britain. They, they've always been British before Spanish. George, thank you for the interview. Thank you, Alec. In our three-part series, we've learned that Gibraltar, the territory which two years ago seemed most threatened by Brexit, now seems most confident about the future. 
This new economy of the rock, based on financial services, on tourism, on the gaming industry, may not be as stable as the, the pillars of Hercules. But if one of these areas was to go down or get into trouble, then no doubt the entrepreneurial Gibraltarians would find another area of enterprise to move into. One thing's for sure, in these uncertain times, the rock is standing tall and strong. So from Tasmina, myself and everyone at the Alex Salmon Show, it's goodbye for now.